here for our prayer and scripture readings. And we have an open Sunday. If anyone wants to serve in that, just let me know. We have a couple Sundays that aren't spoken for. Also, go Phillies, right, Joe? Right. Eight wins away. Okay, so this morning, I'm going to start with a question. Does anybody know what this is or what these are? Anybody shout it out? AirPods? Yep. Apple AirPods. You put them in your ears. They're headphones, wireless headphones. Anybody know what this one is? It's only one. AirPods, again, you think so? These are actually not. These are knockoff um, AirPods. They look very much like the same thing, a little bit different shaped, but they look like the same thing, right? But they're not. We actually found these at Fashion Sense. They look in almost every single way. They even light up like an actual AirPod, but they're not. They're just a toy. They're a cheap knockoff of the real thing. They look so much like the real thing. They even have the little, it looks like Apple writing on the back, but it's not actually the real thing. It's a play. It's a, it's a toy. It's an item for play. And I wanted to start here because this is an important thought to keep in mind as we continue in our study of the Holy Spirit and as we turn where Wilmer just read for us in Acts chapter 1, those first 11 verses of the book of Acts. Because there are a lot of things in our world and in our lives that can look like the real thing but they don't actually function like the real thing. You could try to use these as AirPods, but you'd be sitting in silence. They don't actually do anything. They don't do what AirPods are designed to do. And here we turn to the book of Acts, which is one of my favorite books in the Bible to study because Luke, our author, as inspired by the subject of our study this morning, the Holy Spirit, he covers a lot of ground in these 28 chapters. He relays to us a lot of historical fact in a meticulously designed package in both his gospel after his name and now in part two, act two, if you will, of Jesus Christ. That is the book of Acts. Luke and Acts are separated in our English Bible, but that's only because of, of scroll length, right? They are, they are meant to be read as one continuous work. And you can really look at this one continuous work as one continuous work in two acts. Think about it like a play in our modern day. Act number one is Jesus Christ in the flesh. Luke, the book of Luke, is all that Jesus said and did, all that he fulfilled from the Old Testament prophets and prophecies about the Messiah, all in every way that Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies. It's a testimony of all these individuals who bear eyewitness testimony that Jesus said and did all these things. The 24 chapters of Luke are in Acts number one, Acts chapter one, are the drama of Jesus Christ in the flesh, living out in our world and in our lives. And as with any play of length and substance in our day, there is an intermission between act one and then act number two. The intermission, though, is not the cross. It's not Friday to Sunday of Easter week. It's not even this 40-day period in which we're studying this morning between Jesus' resurrection and ascension that Luke writes about here, when Jesus is spending his time, again, teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God. Obviously, in this moment, Act 1 is still playing out. Jesus is still in the flesh, very active in living out in this time period. Act number 1 is still very much in effect because Jesus is at work and present in the flesh in our world. Rather, the intermission comes, the waiting for the drama to continue to fold comes after Acts chapter 1, verse 9, and all the way until Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It's a 10-day waiting period between God in the flesh ascending to the right hand of God until God in the spirit ascended, descended, I should say, and indwelt in the flesh. Indwelt in our flesh, in the flesh of every single believer who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone who calls on the name of the one who ascended and is sitting at the right hand of God in our flesh. Act 1 of the book of Acts is not in the book of Acts, but it is in Luke where Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, moves by the power of God around our world, teaching in both word and deed about the kingdom of God. And then act number two of the book of Acts is the actual book of Acts from Acts chapter two forward. 
where Jesus is no longer walking the streets of the earth, but he's ascended by the power of God to the right hand of God, yet the power of God is still very much at work. God himself is still very much at work in this new hour, in this act too, by the Holy Spirit, which is indwelt in each and every one of us. And here, what we see in these 11 verses is the power that comes, the change that comes about in this new era, this new act that we are still a part of 2,000 years later, that is inaugurated at Pentecost by the Holy Spirit. And today, we see the why behind kind of our theme verse for this series, which is John chapter 16, verse 7. Why it is better that the Holy Spirit has come and Jesus has left us in the flesh. Remember, Jesus tells us very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And so one of the things we see, the first reason that we see that it is good that the Holy Spirit has come and that Jesus has gone is that now, with even in Jesus' absence, we have the errorless word of God. Verse number one starts with Luke writing, much like he wrote at the beginning of the gospel. He says, in my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. And I want us to see two things here. First, I want to see the connection for Christians because of the connection that there was for Christ between both our words and our deeds. Think about this. What did Luke write about Theopolis and anyone else who has questions about God or about his son Jesus? He wrote all about what Jesus began to do and what he began to teach, what he began to speak. There was a connection for Christ. There was a perfect connection between what Christ said and what Christ did. Now, the question, the connection for us as human beings without the Holy Spirit, even as Christians without the Holy Spirit, um, or, or I should say, even, with, even with, as Christians with the Holy Spirit, is our connection between our words and our deeds is not so perfect, right? Look at the example of our pal Peter. Peter says, I will stand with you, Jesus, even if everyone else abandons you. A few hours later, though, Jesus or Peter abandons Jesus and nothing more than the question of a servant girl by a fire. For Christians today, we are often and in many ways very good at letting the world know where we stand through our mouth. Maybe more appropriate to say we're very good at telling the world where we stand through the mouth of our keyboard on our computer, right? But we are less good at letting the world know where we stand with our deeds, actually falling through our words, through our actions. Everybody knows, for example, that Christians are for the sanctity of human life through our words, but do they know that through our actions, through our deeds? If they did, would our foster care system have so many children in it? Would the foster care system be so broken? Everybody knows that Christians are for the preservation of a biblical marriage and God-defined genders, but does the world know that also through our actions, through our relaying of those words, that, that we too are sinners who have found grace and restoration in Jesus Christ, that we have found grace and restoration, not hatred and condemnation for our sins like the world and, and their sins. Everybody knows that Christians are for the Bible being in schools, but have Christians through their actions stepped up to the plate and taken advantage of ministries like the ones that we have in our backyard, like Bible to School, who not only take the Bible to school, but actually take the church, the people of God, the teachings of God, worship of God to the school and to our children. Everybody knows that Christians are for people in our circle, people that are like us, coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But when God opens a door for us to go to people that maybe aren't like us and share the hope of Christ with them, are our schedules too full to, to back, our, our de back our words through our deeds? We are people created and now restored to be like our Savior and Creator, people of both word and deed. People enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit to both tell and show the world all that Jesus has told and shown us. And one of the greatest tools, I would say the greatest tools that the Holy Spirit gives to us is in our ability to rely on the very word of God. We talked about this just last week already in our study, but we have to see this reality clearly. Take 
the Bible, the, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, not just Matthew to John, not just those, the Gospels and, and those words in red, but Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to Revelation chapter 22, verse 21, that is God's word. This, I'm sure, is it's not a new push. It's existed for the past 2,000 years of church history. But we have seen in recent years pushes from prominent evangelical teachers to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. We just spoke about last week this recent trend to push and to, to discount the words of Paul as just that, as the words of Paul and the not the word of God. And why is that? I remind you why that is. Well, it's because the smaller you make the word of God, the, the less of the word of God that you have to, start to follow and submit to. The less of the word of God that you have to obey. I mean, if you can chuck out everything from the Old Testament, everything from the letters of Paul as either antiquated or the mere words of man, then there isn't a whole lot of God to obey anymore. You have made the word of God pretty small, and thus your commitment to God is, is very small. Meanwhile, you've opened the door, you swung the door wide open for you to write your own rules for life, to write your own roadmap to what is true and what is right. We have to see and believe that Acts chapter 1 verse 2 is true, that Jesus gave instructions through the Holy Spirit of God long after he ascended to heaven to the apostles that he had chosen. That Jesus gave the apostles, through the Holy Spirit, instructions, teachings. And that those apostles, as empowered, as enabled, as guided by the Holy Spirit, gave us those instructions on paper, through the Word of God. The inerrancy, the infallibility of the Bible, how it is the literal Word of God, is not something that man came up with so that man can control other man, but it is rather something that God inspired through man for man's good. The Bible is without error. The Bible is the literal God-breathed word of God. That is what we stand on. That is what we believe as Peckway Evangelical Congregational Church. The Bible changes from being just another book, just another book containing many, I think 66 different letters, to the literal word of God, Luke reminds us, in these two verses of Acts. This is one of the, the best testimonies that we have in our Bible for the Bible being the inspired word of God. And then he spends the next nine verses highlighting the change that takes place when we submit to the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. First, he reminds us that without the Holy Spirit, without God's work in our lives, we are powerless. He draws us back to that intermission that we spoke about at the beginning between act one of Jesus being here in the flesh and act number two of Jesus being here by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Luke reminds us that after his sufferings, Christ presented himself to the apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will all be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here's another example of Jesus referring to the Holy Spirit as a gift as we unpacked last week in our study of the Gospel of John. If you really pause for a moment and think about verse number four, what Jesus says there. Jesus says to the apostles, do not leave Jerusalem. If you think about that and think about what the, the Great Commission that we talk about almost every week, doesn't that sound counterintuitive to the same Jesus who tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. Here he tells us to not go. Do not even leave the home base of Jerusalem. But we have to see that, that all this hinges on. It's a clear reminder for us that the coming of the Holy Spirit is what enables us to even think about carrying out a, a grand commission like making disciples of all nations. Why Jesus so clearly and is so obvious with it is important is Luke tells us to, to wait. To wait in Jerusalem. To not even try to make disciples without the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that is because it would be futile for those disciples and for any disciples of our day to leave without surrendering to the power of the Holy Spirit, without following the guiding and enabling of the Holy Spirit. We are, you can think John chapter 15, we are powerless without the Holy Spirit. We are the branches and Jesus 
is the vine. Let me ask you, you know this from, from gardening, what good are branches when they're not connected to the vine? They are, they are worthless. They are powerless. They are, in fact, dead. They can do nothing. They will not grow without the vine. They will not accomplish their task of bearing fruit without the vine. The same is true of us without the power of the Holy Spirit. And think about the absolute flip that happens when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, the complete reversal of the command given to us by Christ. Without the Holy Spirit, in verse number four, we are told, don't even think about leaving Jerusalem. Stay in those houses that you are cooped up in for protection. But then, with the Holy Spirit, we are told in verse number eight, not only don't leave Jerusalem, but leave Jerusalem, leave the familiar surroundings of Judea, go into the places of Samaria, of the people that you hate, and then continue to the very ends of the earth. Do this knowing that as you go, nothing will be able to stand against you. Jesus reminds us that if we remain in his branch, if we remain in the branch and the power of the Holy Spirit, he reminds us if we remain in him and, and God's words remain in us, ask him whatever we wish and it will be done for us. For this is for his Father's glory. It is for his Father's glory that we would bear much fruit. And it is through this fruit that we prove that we are his disciples. We are powerless without the Holy Spirit. We are told, don't even think about leaving home base without the Holy Spirit. But then with the Holy Spirit, we are limitless. We are told to, to put no limits, no limits on where we go in the name of Jesus. Ask in the name and in the ways of the Holy Spirit and it will be done. Ask and it will be given for God's glory, for it is God's glory for him to enable us to bear much fruit in his name and in his ways. We are powerless without the Holy Spirit, and I remind us before we talk about how we are with the Holy Spirit, that we are often clueless without the Holy Spirit. Verse number six, then they gathered the apostles around Jesus and asked him. They said, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Now, the disciples oftentimes take a lot of flack for this question of Jesus. Of course, we know that the disciples were looking at all this. We talked about this last week. They were looking at Jesus much like we still are prone to look at Jesus. They were looking at Jesus as someone who should come into their life and make all of their problems, all their worldly problems, go away. As someone who should come and make things better for them and make the world better as they define better, right? We talked about it last week. Their biggest problem in their eyes was Rome. Their chief problem and their definition of better was for Jesus to come in and wipe Rome off the map. It was for Jesus to come in and the example of King David restore the kingdom to Israel and put their place as the ruler of the nations. That's what the disciples are asking for Jesus to do in this question. If it's that time that Jesus is going to do it. And let me tell you, American Christians are absolutely no different in this. In what context often does the question of when Jesus' return come up? It comes up often in the context of America's fall from our perceived place as a nation of God, right? Our place of power that we once stood. We are so fond of asking God to bless America or to restore America, and there's certainly nothing sinful in that. When, when ultimately, though, what we should be asking, though, is for God to restore the, in, the entire world. What we should be asking God to do is to restore the world and, and all of its people and all of its nations, and then to start that restoration right here in our own hearts. The disciples asked Jesus, is it now that you are going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus doesn't deny the fact, don't miss this, Jesus never denies the fact that he is one day going to restore the kingdom. He is going to do what the disciples are asking and questioning about him about when he's going to do it. But what he makes sure that the disciples and, and that we know that he isn't going to restore the kingdom that they are picturing, the kingdom that they had in mind. For the disciples, it isn't going to be a kingdom of just Israelites. It isn't going to be a kingdom of just one group of people that are going to be restored. 
for us. We need to always remind ourselves that it isn't just going to be America that's going to be restored. So it shouldn't just be America that we should seek to be restored. For our God is so much bigger. Our God is so much better. Our God is so much more powerful than just restoring one nation and one people. Rather, he is going to. Note again, Jesus doesn't correct the disciples from wanting even the kingdom to be restored. Rather, what he does say to us is you need to receive that the kingdom is so much bigger than, than Israel. That the kingdom, the restoration that I'm about to bring is so much better and bigger than one nation. You need to see it as a whole lot more than Jerusalem, as your home base, as your comfort zone, as your nation's capital. You need to see the kingdom as Judea. Picture when you read of Judea as all the countryside, as all the surrounding people that surrounded Jerusalem, and again, the, that nation's, the people's capital. And then Jesus really prods the disciples, and he really prods us, and he says, you need to see the kingdom that I am going to restore as Samaria as well. Who are the Samaritans? Who was Samaritan? Samaria? Who do they represent? Jesus is saying to the disciples, he's saying to us, you need to see and you need to seek the kingdom, the kingdom restoration that I'm bringing as your hated neighbor. That's who the Samaritans were. As the people that you, Israel, that these disciples still in their, in their earthly flesh, that the Jews, that they still hated. You need to see that I, am not, I have not come to wipe them out as you have hoped and you are still seeking, but rather I am going to restore them just as I am restoring you. And then Jesus says to us and the disciples, in, in, in to the ends of the earth, he says, whatever limits you are placing on my restoration, on the restoration of my Father's kingdom, whatever limits you placed on them, wipe them away. Wipe them completely from your memory. He leaves no room for hate or limits of his restoration and power of the Holy Spirit when he says to us, to the very ends of the earth. We, I mention this verse a lot, for it is our calling. It is who and what we are as believers, as the church of Jesus Christ. If you ask us, what is a Christian? What does a Christian do? We are, we are witnesses of Jesus. We are witnesses of the hope, of the love, of the forgiveness of sins that we have felt and, and experienced in Jesus Christ, that we have seen in Jesus Christ. And we are empowered by the limitless power of the Holy Spirit to be these witnesses to the ends of the earth. With the Holy Spirit and, and, and his empowerment, there is no limit to what we can do in Christ's name and no limit on who, to who or to where we can do it for. And so I want us to picture, to, the picture to be in our mind of this expansion of the ministry of our witness to the ends of the earth. This restoration of not only the kingdom of God in the places that we're familiar with, but our sight in seeking the kingdom of God in places that we're maybe not familiar with or we even hate. You see, this expansion of the triangle, Jerusalem was, was home base for the disciples. That was the place they wanted to be restored. Judea was their neighbors. They, they could see that place being restored, those people being restored. You expand the triangle a little bit. But where it became difficult for the disciples was when Jesus says, you need to restore the kingdom. I'm going to restore the kingdom in Samaria. I'm going to restore those you hate. I'm going to restore a land. I'm not going to smite this land. I'm going to save that land just as I'm going to save your land and its people. That again, the, 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 the triangle that never ends to the very ends of the earth. We seek not only what we see and naturally seek of the kingdom of God, which is our Jerusalem. It starts not only in Judea, our neighbors, those that we are familiar with and are the same as us. But the kingdom restoration that we seek and that we're going to see one day, it's going to cross over into those that are vastly different than us. Those, that, that, that those worldly differences have caused us to hate our Samaritans. And then if there are, is any limits to our seeking to see the restoration of the kingdom, God blows the doors off of them. And he says, you need to seek the restoration of my kingdom to the ends of the earth. Because God is going to restore all things for all people in all places. And he's going to do this in his perfect timing and in his perfect ways by his authority. So when we talk about these verse, Acts 1.8, 
in, in probably next Sunday, as we do almost every Sunday, we reference these verses. Keep this picture in your mind. Keep this picture of what Jesus is actually doing. He's expanding our vision for his kingdom in these verses. And remind us, and remember as we do this, that we are limitless with the Holy Spirit. Limitless in what we can accomplish. Think about our world and our lives. What is the worst thing that can happen in this sin-filled and fallen world? What is the one thing that no matter how many advances in science and medicine, what is the one thing that human beings will never be able to defeat by their own power? It's death, right? Death is the worst thing. It is the great equalizer that awaits every single one of us, unless Christ calls us home before then. You know, for the example, Steve Jobs, he gave birth to all of these wonderful Apple projects and all of these wonderful advances in technology, which gave birth to vast amount of, amounts of wealth in his life. But the same equalizer awaited him as awaits us. Yet through the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is this. If the Spirit of raised, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. So if the Holy Spirit lives in you, which we know we now have, and it is true of our lives as those who have called out to Jesus Christ. In faith, the Holy Spirit, this power lives in us. We know that this comes about by grace. So as a gift of God through Jesus Christ, it comes about by confessing with our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord. It comes about by believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. By believing in our hearts that on the cross, Jesus Christ paid the price for each and every one of our sins, no matter how great or how many of those sins may be. It comes by our belief that in his resurrection, he has defeated the consequence, that ultimate consequence that is death for our sin. By believing and receiving this gift by faith, you will be saved. That if this is true of your life, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you have the power over everything. Even the worst thing that sin can throw at you at, at death, you are powerful over it through the Holy Spirit. You have the power to conquer it through the Holy Spirit. That power that you have is without limit through the Holy Spirit. There is nothing that can tame, nothing that can tamper with, nothing that can temper in any way the power that rests within you. You are with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do anything necessary to be Christ's witnesses anywhere in the world under any circumstances. You are enabled and empowered to bear witness to Jesus Christ. That's the power that comes to you. That's the power that dwells in you. That's the power that's available to you through the Holy Spirit. And so often in the church, such little things compared to this power, clicks and gossip, lies and deceits, lethargy and apathy, disunity and distrust, changing contexts and cultures, lacking finances, such little things compared to the power of our God throw us off the path of being and doing what God calls us to be and to do. The path that, that God not only has for us, the path, that, the path that God empowers us for. So I say to you, don't let these little things throw us off God's path. Don't let these little things stop us from being and doing what God calls us to be and do. But remember, he doesn't only call us to be and do these things. He empowers us to be and do these things to be his witnesses without limit to the ends of the earth. His witnesses are, who are to go. To go be his limitless witnesses, but are often motionless. Verse number nine, after he said this, Jesus was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Verse number 10, they, the apostles, were looking intently up in the, into the sky as he was going. And suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And said to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? For this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus gives this command and assurance in fulfilling this command to us and his original disciples. He gives us this command and assurance that, that we just talked about, that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead rests in you. And then look what the initial disciples do with it. The same thing that, that we often do with it. 
They stood there looking up into the sky, waiting for Jesus to give them more direction, to give them more empowerment. Waiting for Jesus to give them direction while ignoring the direction that he had just given to us. So I say to us, don't stand there looking up into the sky, waiting for Christ to return. Rather, what Christ tells us is, go prepare for me to return, right? First, do this by preparing your own heart. The Holy Spirit comes to first restore not a grand kingdom, not an all-encompassing kingdom of the globe, but to restore the kingdom of our hearts. He starts with, with our hearts. The Holy Spirit doesn't first convict the world of sin. He first convicts us of sin. He convicts us of our personal sin. The Holy Spirit and its power over sin comes immediately and fully into our hearts at the moment of our salvation. But we are prone to still hold on to the reins of our sin, right, in our lives. We are prone to still hold on to the world and all of its fallacies of sin. Prepare your hearts by making way for the Holy Spirit and its power to do what it's going to do. Convict you, but then cleanse you of your sin. Wash it away. Cut it off at its roots and enable you to be more like your Savior and Creator. The Holy Spirit, again, He doesn't only convict us of our sin. He doesn't only bring more shame into our lives because of our sin. But the Holy Spirit has the power to remove sin from our lives, to free us from the chains of sins, to help us take off those old garments of sin and put on the new garments of our new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit has the power to convict us, but then cleanse us of our sin. So give him the reins. Allow him to do the work in your life and on your sin that he's going to do. And then Jesus reminds us as he does that, go. Go and be and do what he is empowering you to go, be, and do. Be limitless witnesses of Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. We talked about this last week. Number one, I should say, we talked about this in week number one of our Bible study on Monday night. There, there, are, there are no excuses for Christians. We lack nothing. We long for nothing. The Holy Spirit, the power of God, it dwells within us. So don't stand there looking up into the sky, longing for something more, expanding energy, waiting for Jesus to return. You have your marching orders to fulfill before he returns. The time is getting short until he returns. And you have the power to fulfill those marching orders before he returns. In fact, he won't return until we fulfill those marching orders. The power to accomplish this grand task, it rests within each and every one of us. But what Jesus says to us here through his word is, is don't let it rest in you, but to put it to work. Be Christ, limitless witnesses today to the very ends of the earth. We see this, the power of the Holy Spirit, the push of the Holy Spirit come and play out just through the small sample of church history that is the book of Acts. We see here, we see before the stoning of Stephen, we see the church stationary. We see the church being witnesses of Christ, but being witnesses of Christ only in Jerusalem. And so the Holy Spirit comes and he pushes them through the stoning of Stephen. And then even after that, the Holy Spirit literally comes and he picks Philip up and he takes them from Jerusalem to evangelize outside of Jerusalem in Acts 8. The Lord has to come and speak to Peter in a dream and say, hey, you need to evangelize more than Jews. You need to evangelize those outside of your comfort zone, those outside of your known nation. We are absolutely prone as a people, even as Christian people, to be and to stay motionless, to stay where we are comfortable. It's the problem of, of what I call the problem of the likes. We stay with people who are like us. We stay with people who like us. We stay with the people that we like. But that's not who or what we are called and empowered to be and to do. We are called to be in motion, to go, and as we go, be witnesses of Jesus Christ, limitless witnesses of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we close this morning, let me ask you a question. What limits are you placing on the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? 
Where are you doing your best to keep him motionless in your life? Don't ask or answer for yourself. Be and allow the Holy Spirit to make clear, and he will, make clear to you the work that he wants to do first in you, but then through you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this study of your word, Lord, and, and these passages. This is a passage today that, that we are quite familiar with here, and, and we hear it almost every week on a weekly basis. But Lord, I, I pray that you would open our eyes to see it anew and afresh, that you would help us to not only see these words, to not only read these words, but to apply these words to our life, Lord. Lord, we see in Jerusalem and Judea, we see places on a map, Lord, but these are actually places in our hearts that we are holding on to your gospel, seeking to stay in our comfort zone of Jerusalem, maybe expanding in ways that we're comfortable to Judea, but, but we're certainly not prone to go to Samaria, the people that we hate. We're certainly not prone to people to think that we have the power to go to the very ends of the earth in your name and in your ways and with your gospel, Lord. But yet here, the very foundation of this act, of this place in history that we are a part of, the church era, the era where the Holy Spirit dwells within each and every one of us who call on the name of the Lord, we are prone, we are empowered to, to go do this, to lay aside our hatred for a group, to expand outside of our comfort zone, to go to the very ends of the earth and know that in our going, your work will be seen through us. That our, your work will be seen in our lives, convicting us of our sins, making our hearts new, helping us again to put on those new garments of eternal life in Christ. But then as you do that work, you can't help as we go, as we are witnesses to you, for the world to say, hey, what's different about those individuals? Why do they give up so much? Why do they go so much? Why did they come to me? And in whose name did they come to me, Lord? And as those conversations and inactions happen, Lord, may we be people that present the full gospel of Jesus Christ through your word. The good news that your son has come to us, lived his life among us, the perfect life free from sin, and then laid that perfect life free from sin down in our place, paid the ransom for our sin, and then on the third day rose from the grave. And in that resurrection, in our belief and in our hope, in our faith in that resurrection, we too are given new and eternal life, Lord. May that be what propels us forward, and may that be the song that our lives plays for the world to see and hear and respond to. Lord, I pray that, again, you write these truths on our hearts as we continue in worship, and we praise the great name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Aren't you glad that we are connected to the vine, who gives us his Holy Spirit? Let's go. Help Jesse.